Sarah, you're still having a problem with the with opening the link. Um, maybe what I can do is I can copy and paste the uh, the individual paragraphs for you, okay? So that you can you can read them as we go. I'm not sure why it's working because usually this site works works for everyone. Usually it's not blocked in in any countries or anything like that. So I'm not sure why it's not working, but that's okay. We can. I'll post the, the paragraphs for you as we're reading. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, April, would you like to read first today? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, the monster ships that changed how we travel. The beauty saloons swimming pools and even wireless communications of today's huge cruise ships all got their start with the floating palaces of a century ago when the world's then largest ocean liner embarked on its first transatlantic voyage in september 19 thousands of spectators gathered at the docks of Liverpool to watch. She presented an impressive picture as she left with her mighty funnels and brilliant illumination, wrote one reporter. Cunard's RMS Lusitania had been outfitted with a new type of engine that, differ that differed from that of its rivals and would go on to break on to break to break to break the speed record for the fastest ocean crossing not once but twice uh, shall i stop here because there we are with a lot of people sure let's read some shorter pieces today maybe we'll get to to read twice but let's see okay so there are any questions or comments about this first section here Okay, embarked. Can anyone explain what embarked means? Yeah, embarked is kind of like uh, took off, but for, for boats. So usually we use embarked for for boats and a takeoff for um, for for airplanes. Um, April, yes, Kanyad is the name of the person. I think April. I'm always confused between embarked and disembark. If I have to fill in the the form uh, when you come to an airport. I never know, don't know which city I have to put in this embarkation or in embarkation. What's that? What is the, the difference? What which which city do I have to put it, uh, Natasha? Ah, okay. Well, let's see if somebody else can answer your question first. Can anyone explain about which one is, uh, which city is the one the way you embark and which is disembark? Um, so I think when you embark is the when you are, for example, if I'm in my in my city, so I'm embarking from Bogota and I will disembark, for instance, in the US and someplace or Miami, for instance. Yes, exactly. Embark is where you get on the plane or the boat or whatever it might be. And disembark is when you get off. So it's like where you arrive. So you have to to fill in both uh, cities then in that form because you are embarked in your city and you and and then you arrived at that city in the airport and I, you have to fill in that uh, that uh, form. So you have to have to fill the both names, no? I think so. Yes, because I think usually on that form they're not just interested in where you have arrived but where you arrived from. 
because they do some kinds of tracking um, to know where people are visiting from or um, where people came from, maybe where their last stop was. Sometimes it's for like for health and safety reasons as well to know um, because they have special checks, for example, if you come from a specific country. Um, I know when I travel back to Australia usually and they see that I'm traveling from Brazil, they always uh, they always do a special check because they have to check for um, my yellow fever vaccination. Um, so sometimes that's why it's important, I think, to have both the country that you embarked from and the um, country that you disembarked or the city that you disembarked in. But at this embarkation, it's actually, I, no, I think it is not important because they have to know that. <laughs> Why should I feel it? They know that I'm disembarkation, my disembarkation city is there in that airport, no? So ah, it's because they don't always keep those forms in the same place. It goes to a central processing center, and so they don't know where the form came from by the time that somebody okay. has to enter it in a computer. <laughs> Okay, any other questions about this part? Okay, yes, words then largest. What do you think they mean by then largest? Exactly, yes. It's talking about the fact that it was the largest at that time. So even though it wouldn't be the largest now, at that time, it was the largest ocean liner that they had. Any other questions in this part? No? Okay, let's keep reading then. Uh, Monique, would you like to read? Okay. Between 1850 and 1900, three British passenger lines, Cunard, Inman, and White Star, dominated transatlantic travel. Toward the end of the century, as increasing numbers of emigrants sought passage to the US and a growing class of Gilded Age travelers demanded speed and luxury, corporate rivalry inter intensified. Pressure from the from other European lines forced the British companies to add amenities like swimming pools and restaurants. Should I continue? <laughs> A little bit more. Okay. Not unlike today's rivalries between, say, aircraft manufacturers like Airbus and Boeing, each race to make its ocean liners the largest, fastest, and most opulent. In the process, they launched the modern age of leisure, uh, leisure, yeah, cruising, and developed innovations and technologies that continue to be used on cruise ships today. Thank you. Let's take a look at this part here. Questions, comments? Ah, rivalry intensified. Can anyone explain this phrase? Yes, exactly. Rivalry is like a competition between two or more people or groups. Um, so when they say that it intensified, it means that this competition got even stronger. It became even greater than it was in the past.
Any other questions in this part? Passenger lines. What do they mean by passenger lines? This may maybe be a little bit easier if you think about the fact that we talk about passenger lines and we talk about cargo lines. Exactly, yes. So passenger lines refer to, it could be ships or it could be aircraft actually, um, but they refer to, actually it could refer to buses as well, but basically it's about routes which carry passengers that transport people. If we talk about cargo lines, we're talking about routes that just take things, um, just take objects, but don't actually take people with them. So it's just talking about the kind of route it is, whether it's one that takes objects or one that takes people. What about this word here, opulent? What does opulent mean? Yes, exactly. They want to make it luxurious, um, like uh, using things that are very wealthy, very good, uh, very good condition, um, very fancy kind of things. Any other questions in this section? Okay, let's keep reading then. Uh, Shady, would you like to read? Yes, okay. Uh, in the middle uh, 19th century, there were uh, two main players, Inman's inaugural uh, steamship, uh, launched in 1850, made it uh, the first major British line to replace traditional side mounted uh, paddle wheels with a screw propeller and uh, uh, apparatus with fixed plates turning on central axis. With uh, the added speed and fuel efficiency, this brought plus a sleek iron hull that was more durable than wood. Inman established itself as a company unfair to try new technology for faster crossings. Inman uh, rival in my main rival, uh, Cunard, uh, focused on safety instead. The Cunard way was uh, to let uh, competitors introduce new, fla new fungal uh, technology and let them deal with uh, the setbacks. Say, uh, Michel uh, Gulger, uh, Cunard's company historian, once that the technology had uh, proved itself once only then would uh, Cunard consider using it. Thank you. Let's take a look at this section here. Uh, questions, comments about this part? Mm, okay, sleek iron hull. What is a sleek iron hull? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Shiny's got it. It's the body of the, the ship. Exactly. The hull is like that body part of the ship, um, the part that's partly underneath the water, that outside part. And the iron is the, the material that it's made from. What's sleek mean then? Hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. Like smooth, very aerodynamic, um, could be very shiny as well. But yeah, it's that kind of that smooth iron body of the ship. Okay. What about newfangled? What is newfangled? It's not quite inaugural, but you're on the right kind of track. Um, I think here, make sure you've got the right spelling of it. It's actually fangled, not flange. Okay, <laughs> make sure we've got the right word. Um, new fangled is usually something we use to talk about something's new, but it's not just new. It means it's really different from everything else that we're using as well. So if we say that something's new fangled, it's not just something new on the same thing. It's something that's really different as well. Yeah, like really modern or it could be strange as well or unique really different from the from what's what's available at the moment okay I think there was another question as well maybe that I missed have I missed something Or are there any other comments or questions in this section? Ah, inaugural. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was an answer to another one. <laughs> what does inaugural mean? Yes, exactly. Inaugural, we talk about the the first time that something that something happens. Um, inauguration would be the the opening of of something new. So inaugural means the the first thing. So for example, you can have the inaugural concert, the inaugural speech, the inaugural class, the inaugural um, meeting. It means the the, the thing that shows that marks the beginning of something basically. So when they talk about in the article about the inaugural steamship, they're talking about the first one that they launched, the first one that was released um, before they started releasing a lot of these kinds of steamships. Does that answer your question, Eric? Yes, exactly. We talk about the king's inauguration. That's one way that it's used a lot. Or the president as well, the president's inauguration. Any other questions in this part? Ah, propeller. What is a propeller? Do we have any engineers here or any mechanics? <laughs> I don't think we do today, actually. Can anyone explain what a propeller is? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's something that rotates around. It has kind of a, a number of blades around it. And as it rotates around, it, it moves something else forward. So it, um, propels the boat forward or makes the, the, the boat move forward.
they kind of do look a little bit like fan blades as well, actually. Any other questions in this part? April? Uh, back to the inaugural, is that then that period or that time that one or another very important person have has to uh, to hit a bottle of champagne uh, against uh, the the body of the ship? Yes, that would be the inauguration. Yes, inaugural is just an adjective. So we have to use inaugural with something else. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. But at the inauguration, yes, that's exactly what they do when they hit the, the ship with a bottle of champagne. OK, thank you. OK, let's keep reading. Uh, Luca, would you like to read? Yes. But Cunard risked behind, left behind both by him and by a new rival which burst, which, which burst onto the ship in 1870. The White Star Lines splashed the but included five huge ocean lines. Uh, the debut debut included <laughs> de, debut okay included five huge ocean liners dubbed uh, floating hotels their flagship rms oceanic launched in 1871 and had and had efficient compound engines that burned just 58 tons tons of coal per day compared with 110 tons consumed by Iman's ship. That gave White Star that budget to invest in comfort. The contrast with Cunard was stark. Where Oceanic had bat tubes, Cunard offered a basing. Where Oceanic had central heating, Cunard offered stoves. And where Oceanic had lavatories, Cunard managed with clamber pots. Says Gallagher. Chamber pots, sorry. Says Gallagher. Architects for Oceanic also moved first class cabins to midship for less rocking on the waves. Thank you. Okay, sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> Let's have a look at this section here. Any questions or comments about this part? Ah, debut. Okay. This is obviously a word that English has taken from another language because you can see that we don't pronounce the T in it. Yes, it's French. Does anyone know what it means though? Yes, exactly. It's about the start or the beginning of something. So when we talk about the, the ship's debut, it means when it's first released really to the public or when it's first shown or um, first available really to the public. So when we talk about a splashy debut, they're kind of making a little bit of a joke because of the fact it's a boat and we talk about a boat splashing maybe. But splashy always also means um, that it makes a big impact so they're saying that the release of these boats created a, a big impact really on the whole industry. Mm, stove. What is a stove? Exactly. <laughs> it's like an oven. Um, it's, it's something that you use to cook, actually. Um, so they did use it in some places as well to for heating, um, but it was kind of a, a mix between something used for heating and something used for, for cooking as well.
Any other questions in this part? April? Uh, about the flagship here, is that here, uh, do they mean here a ship with a flag or is that the, the one that, that the, this is, they are so proud of? Yes, the that they are second so proud option. Of. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's not a literal meaning here. It's not a ship with a flag. Flagship means like their, um, their best or the most important or the 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 biggest or the uh, most impressive one that they have ah dubbed i have a feeling we've spoken about this word recently does anyone remember Ah, in some cases it can mean subtitles, <laughs> um, but here it's actually meant uh, giving a name to something. So kind of you give a nickname or you give another name to something else. So in this case, it means that instead of just calling them ocean liners, they started calling them floating hotels because they were, they resembled more fancy hotels than just normal ships, other ships of the time. Any other questions in this part? Okay, let's keep reading. Uh, Claire, would you like to read? In the 1880s and 1890s, each of White Star's new ships captured the Blue Ribbon and an, and an official accolade which recognizes the passenger line, liner able to make the fastest average speed on a westbound Atlantic crossing. In answer, Inman built as, as City of New York and as, as City of Paris. The City of Paris won the Blue Ribbon several times thanks to its expensive bur but fuel efficient triple expansion engines and twin screw propellers. The innovation was a first for an ocean liner and meant that if one propeller broke, the other could compensate. Finally, ending the need for auxiliary sails. This suddenly freed up a lot of lot more space on deck that would later be put to good use by providing luxury facilities for their passengers. Thank you. Okay, let's take a look at this part here. Questions? Okay, accolade. Does anyone know what accolade means? Exactly, it could be praise and or award for something. But usually when we do talk about accolade, um, we are talking about a specific kind of award. So it's usually a little bit more formal than just uh, being praised for something. Even if they said, as in the article, it says an unofficial accolade, it's kind of like an unofficial prize that they're giving or an unofficial award that they're giving for something. Any other questions in this part? Auxiliary sales. What do you think they mean by this? Oh. 
Exactly. Auxiliary is usually like extra or something to, to help, really. Um, so when they talk about auxiliary sales, they're talking about additional or extra sales that they might need to, to replace the propellers if the propellers aren't working. The sails is like the, um, the pieces of cloth that they would use to, to be able to steer the boat using the wind or to be able to propel the boat using a wind, like we have in a sailboat. So it isn't the boat themselves, it's just those big uh, sheets basically that would catch the wind. Any other questions here? Eric? Yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering if <laughs> I was thinking about these auxiliary cells and yeah, for example, if you've got such a big uh, ship, <laughs> so if you are able to manage to move with such sails. <laughs> I'm just thinking. Yeah, I don't know how really um, practical or how useful the sails would actually be. <laughs> I was kind of thinking that too. <laughs> I don't think the sails would make um, much of a difference or they'd help very much. But maybe it's just a kind of a temporary measure so they still move forward a little bit um, while they fix the propeller. Yeah, maybe iron sails, yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if those pictures are really from 1888. I don't think so. I think they're actually showing us the, the ocean liners from today. I don't think they were taking colour photos quite that far back ago. And that looks like a very good quality picture as well. So I think that's a more recent picture maybe. Freed up, yes, as people have said, freed up means to to make to make room or to make space for something. Um, you can use it just not for, for stuff as well. You could use it for things like time. So you can free up time in your calendar, for example, if you um, uh, make time to be able to to do something else. Any other questions in this part? Okay, let's keep reading then. Uh, Shiny, would you like to read? Uh, yes. Kanga, meanwhile, ventured into the new world of telecommunications by installing the first Marconi, Marconi wireless stations, which allowed radio operation, operators to transmit messages at sea. On its sister ship, RMS uh, Rukani, and RMS companion. First class passengers could even book European hotels by wireless before reaching port. Connectively, connectivity was just an, as important to passengers in the past as it, it is today, says William Roca, historian and public program programs manager at South Street Seaport Museum in New York City. Thank you. Okay, let's take a look at this part. Questions? Comments? It looks like this was the, <laughs> the um, kind of like the Wi-Fi of today, these wireless stations. Ah, ventured. What does ventured mean? Yeah, 
exactly. It's like entering into something, um, especially if it's a little bit of an adventure or if it's a little bit of a risk. Um, so if you venture into an area, it's kind of like you enter there, but you don't really know exactly what you're going to find. It's not really the same as invented. It's, it's different from invented. It's more about um, starting something new or going into a different area. Any other questions here? Eric, they used the wireless system that they had on the boat. <laughs> um, kind of like if you think of the old um, okay, maybe not quite this old, but like the Morse code kind of systems that they had. So they could use the radio systems. If you think about radio systems that boat usually has, they could uh, contact somebody who was um, who was in the the ship's office on land. Um, they could make contact with somebody on the boat and the person on the boat could say, oh, I want to book my hotel. I want to book this hotel for five nights. And the person on land would probably go, okay, no problem. And then they would call the hotel and probably book it for them. Any other questions here? Yeah, I think we're well, well before the smartphone age on these kinds of boats. <laughs> okay, let's keep reading. Uh, Sarah, would you like to read? Sarah, are you with us? Would you like to read? You don't have to read, but if you'd like to. Okay, no problem. Um, Mauna, would you like to read? Yes, of course. In 1897, Germany answered the five shipping company, no Dutch, to the invite its colossal Kaiser Wilhelm the Gross, which shocked its rival by taking the rule, the blue, by taking the blue ribbon from Britain after. After 52 years, another German li liner, the, the SS Amer America, wound its well held guests by introducing the first à la carte restaurant at sea, the Ritz Cartland, brainchild of Paris. Uh, Hotel Caesar Ritz Hotelier. Caesar, Ritz, and the renowned chef August Escoffier. It allowed guests to order meals at their usual and dine with and din with their friends rather than attend rigidly scheduled sitting. A foreigner of the kind of freestyle dining seen on today's cruise. Chips. Thank you. Okay, let's take a look at this section here. Any questions or comments on this part here? Ah, forerunner. What is a forerunner?
Exactly, yes. Something that came before anything else. Um, so something that that uh, was like the first in its field or kind of showed what was going to come after it. So um, this is like the first kind of example of something that would happen later on today's cruise ships. Yeah, you could think of it being like um, Pioneer as well. Any other questions in this part? Ah, cruise. <laughs> cruise is actually um, the kind of trips that we're talking about that these boats do. So nowadays we talk, we call these kinds of boats um, cruise ships. Um, it's just talking about a, a trip you do by a boat but usually a, a leisure trip. So the idea of the trip is to is to just to be on the boat and to relax and to see new places. It's not like a trip that you're taking to actually go from one place to another. That's not the point. The point is just to enjoy being on the boat and to to experience life on the boat really. Any other questions here? April? Uh, I wonder what does what do they mean with well healed guest here? Healed in the meaning of uh, your field on your feet? Maybe heals so well healed? I don't understand. Yeah, you're on the right track. And yes, Claire and Shady have got it. If someone's well healed, it usually means that they're part of the elite. They're usually the wealthy, rich, um, the very well-to-do kind of kind of guests. Um, and it comes from the fact that um, if they if people had a lot of money, they could usually afford better shoes. So the heels on their shoes were always very good because they could afford to replace them or to fix them. So if you were well healed, it showed that you had you had enough money basically to, to wear good shoes and to keep fixing your shoes as well. Okay, thank you. And I wonder the S the name SS America. It it, it is in I eighteen ninety seven. So if I see the that two letters SS, I'm I think of the SS uh, from Hitler. But it is in 1897. It is in Germany, so it's a could little it bit different, though. <laughs> use, yeah, what is the from uh, which uh, abbreviation is? Is this okay, abbreviation so from which word? SS is actually talking about these letters before the ship's name. Is actually talking about what kind of ship it is. So either the purpose of the ship or the way that it kind of works. So this SS actually means steamship. Um, and they used to use PS to talk about the, the paddle steamer. You might also see now a lot RV nowadays, which is a research vessel. So these letters before the ship's name either tell you what it's used for or how it's powered basically. Yeah, like the engine type, exactly. Okay, uh, there were a few other words here as well. Fray, what is a fray? Yeah, it's probably like a fight. I don't know if I'd go so far to say that it's a war, but let's say it's a fight or some kind of um, dispute against something. So here it says that they, oh, they entered the fray. It means they entered the competition or they entered the fight, basically, to 
see who was going to be the best um, the best shipbuilder. There was one other word here as well. Uh, hotelier. What is a hotelier? Yes, man has got it right. It refers to a hotel and the er at the end shows you that it's a person who works with a hotel. So a hotelier usually means someone who owns or, or runs a, uh, a hotel. Okay, uh, let's keep reading. Uh, Roro, would you like to read? Yes, okay. Uh, to complicate matters, American banking tycoon GP Marge, uh, Margin, Margin was buying up smaller companies to create a U.S. based shipping and uh, real, real road monopoly. In 1991, White, White Star became his biggest acquisition. And man too, no, uh, now was U.S. Uh, owned, having been bought by American company in 1893. Suddenly, the battles weren't only in the broad rooms, building the world's top ocean liners was now a point of national pride. With the help on, uh, of uh, 2.6 million uh, Pound. can, pounds, okay, Gover, uh, government loan, Britain's uh, loans equiv equivalent to more than 261 million pounds today. Britain's uh, Con uh, Con Connors line launched the massive twins RMS uh, Lastinia and RMS uh, Morti uh, Mortania. Both had the first steam turbine engines turbine. of a turbine engines of any superliner. To reach its sustained speed of sustained speed of twenty five knots, uh, forty six point twenty five kilometer. The yeah. Lastinia has kilometers per hour. Hour, okay. The Lastinia had uh, sixty eight uh, additional. From, uh, from six, six more pilot, 52,000 uh, 52, square feet. Square <laughs> feet, okay. Of facing serves and an increase of 30,000 hours power. Reported the New York Times if uh, turbines had not been employed at plus three twenty hundred thousand twenty thousand horsepower engine would have been necessary. Thanks Thank you. For <laughs> no, no problem. You had a lot of numbers and a lot of <laughs> um, strange symbols there as well to read about. Yeah, Thank a lot you. of maths and physics. <laughs> okay, so questions in this part here. Yeah. 
Yes, and the problem was the measurement units weren't written in <laughs> weren't written in words. They just had the symbols there. <laughs> so you had to try to remember what they what they stood for. <laughs> Any questions about the other vocabulary, though? No, there was just the, the numbers that were the, a bit of a tongue twister the numbers and the units that were a little bit complicated here. Okay, let's keep reading then. Um, Eric, would you like to read? It sounds like maybe you would have been more comfortable reading the last part. <laughs> Okay, so White Star fought back with RMS Olympic, RMS uh, Titanic and HMS <laughs> Britannic. Like the Lusitania and Mauritania, White Star's trio would feature double hulls and watertight bulkheads with standard recip reciprocating engines they were slower than the Q. It's hard to read. <laughs> Canada's, maybe. Or maybe Cunardis, or yeah, whatever. Uh, but surpassed them in size and elegance. Elegance. Oh, elegance. The, the Olympic and another white star liner, uh, the Adriatic, even debuted the first indoor debuted. swimming pool Debu Ignore debuted the tea. <laughs> oh, okay yes. debut the first indoor swimming pools at sea first class passenger may indulge in turkish and electric baths take recreation in the gymnasium or with a squash racket or divert himself in the swim swimming pond Marbled one newspaper. Should I continue? Uh, yeah, just the next okay. sentence. Yeah, okay. It was fun for the first class passengers to send postcards back home saying, writing to you from the deck of the world's biggest ship, wish you were here, says historian William H. Miller, G.R. Uh, junior. <laughs> junior. <laughs> yes, another. Um, abbreviation we have here. Okay. Any questions about this part here? Ah, squash racket. Does anyone here play squash? Can anyone explain what a squash racket is? Shady? This is the device which you, or the tools which you are holding, uh, hold it in your hand to play squash or, uh, or uh, table tennis or uh, uh, ground tennis. Yes, exactly. So squash is like a, a sport. Um, it has a racket kind of like tennis, but I think squash has a different kind of ball, right? It's very small ball. Right? Really smaller Can't... than tennis, and the racket is smaller than the tennis also. Yes, I think it has a very long handle as well, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, any other questions in this part? OK, 
Okay, if there's no more questions, maybe we'll keep reading then. Let's see if we can, I don't think we'll get to finish the article, but let's see at least to, if everybody can, can have a go reading. Ah, Luca, remember that the name of the company was um, um, Kunad or Kun, Kunad or something like this. So when they talk about Kunadas, they're just talking about the types of ships that were made by that, by that, um, by that company. Yeah, gymnasium is just the long name for gym. <laughs> That's where gym comes from. <laughs> it was originally called gymnasium, but gymnasium is very long to say, so we shortened it a bit. <laughs> Eric? Uh, is there no way that this word is connected somehow with some type of school or school mm, program system? Or Because all my life I thought that <laughs> It's actually this one as well, but I'm not sure now. <laughs> oh, okay. I just looked up actually, and in the dictionary, it also says that a gymnasium is a school in Germany, Scandinavia, or Central Europe that prepares pupils for university entrance. I never knew that before. <laughs> so mm. you know it is this kind of definition then? Yeah, and I've never known that this is also for gym. <laughs> so. Yeah, interesting. Wow, <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, I guess usually we use gym now just for uh, like where you go to, to do exercise. So um, maybe that's one of the reasons why they decided to, to shorten it as well. So they, they don't have so much confusion about the two things. <laughs> Okay, um, let's read a little bit more because I think maybe everybody has read now except for Nadia. So let's give Nadia a turn to, to read before we finish. Would you like to read? Uh, yes, thank you. History changed course when Titanic hit an iceberg on 14 April 1912 and sank on her first transatlantic voyage. As a result of the tragedy, safety regulations were updated to require lifeboat berths for every passenger and 24-hour radio surveillance, surveillance, rules which are still in place. But there were more challenges to come. World War I broke out in uh, 1914 and European governments requisitioned liners for war service. Then a German submarine uh, torpedoed. Lusitania off the coast of Ireland on 7th May 1915, killing more than a thousand of those on board. Oh, I got the sad part. Yes, I was just thinking, that's not a good thing to end our session on today. We can't end here. <laughs> Nadia, could you read just maybe a little bit more so we don't have to end the session on such a sad note today? Yes, sure. Uh, cruising on. Despite the post-war liner building boom, U.S. anti-immigration laws reduced the number of transatlantic immigrants, the liners, bread and butter in the 1920s. Ships only made money when there were passengers abroad, says David Perry, uh, a, marit a maritime historian. Uh, the companies needed to do something to stay afloat, so they create the tourists. Shall I start okay. here? Yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's a little bit of a happier note. Now we can think about the tourists on the cruise ships again. Okay. Any questions about the vocabulary in this last section? No, no questions? Okay. We've still got a little bit to go um, in the article that's talking about um, what happened 
what happened next really with these these cruise ships or these cruise liners and how they became more for holidays instead of just actually transporting people from one country to another country when they wanted to move. Um, so I think this is kind of interesting as well for for talking about in the next in the next session. So what we might do on Thursday is we might finish we might finish reading the end of the article, and then we can talk more about these cruise ships. Um, maybe if you've been and you can tell us how it was, the kind of things that that they had on board the ship, or if you've seen a lot about these cruise ships, maybe you can tell us what you've seen that they have nowadays. Um, or maybe if you hadn't, <laughs> maybe we can talk about if you'd like to actually go on one of these trips and, you know, spend, spend two weeks aboard a, a cruise ship somewhere sailing around. So let's talk about this on Thursday, but I'll put the topic in the forum as well so that if you can't make it on Thursday or you think of something beforehand, um, you can leave us all a comment on the forum as well so we can talk about it more there too. Okay, thank you very much everyone. I hope you enjoyed the session today and don't forget to hit the red button to hang up the call, okay? Um, hopefully talk to you all again later in the week. Bye everyone.